think we can start. It's um, uh, 8 a.m. Uh, Central Eastern Time on the dot. Uh, my time is 9 a.m. Welcome everyone to this plenary session of the Geo Symposium 2021. Uh, this session is on biodiversity ecosystems and nature-based uh, solutions. It's uh, one of three plenary sessions uh, during this symposium. So in this session, we'll be focusing on the developing work on biodiversity and ecosystem accounting in the GeoArc program, as well as the potential for nature-based solutions. And uh, these activities help address the intersecting threats of climate change, biodiversity loss, ecosystem collapse, pandemics, disaster resilience, and to benefit countries for long-term sustainable development. Uh, the UN Decade of Ecosystem Restoration, and we are going to hear more about that during this session, the recent adoption of the system of environmental economic account uh, and account, uh, ecosystem accounting framework, and the upcoming convention on biological diver diversity uh, during the COP15, as well as the UNFCC climate uh, COP26 in Glasgow, UK, uh, provide a good backdrop to this session. So we are going to have uh, four speakers during this session um, and uh, they will give their presentations in about eight or so minutes each. And uh, then we'll go into a question and answer session. Uh, we'll start off with some, uh, a few questions and uh, mostly look at what the audience uh, will want to know more about the biodiversity ecosystems and nature-based solutions. So our speakers for today are uh, Tom Christofferson, who leads the Nature for Climate a branch of the UNEP, United Nations Environment Program. And he's also the focal point for the UN uh, Decade on Ecosystem Restoration uh, with a degree in forestry and forest conservation engineering for Dresden University. He has previously worked uh, for the Secretariat for the Convention on Biological Diversity, where he led up the portfolio on the conservation and sustainable use of forest biodiversity, among other activities. Uh, we will also have uh, Aime Ginsberg, who manages the natural capital accounting related projects at the South African National Bi Biodiversity Institute. And this includes managing the development of the country's first national level land and terrestrial ecosystems accounts. Uh, through the institution, the institute's collaborative work uh, with the Statistics South Africa, among other activities. Uh, we will also, uh, now Tim will give us some highlights or a background and concept of these biodiversity ecosystems and nature-based solutions next us. And we'll be looking at some opportunities for Earth observation, giving examples from her work at Sandy. And we will also hear from Thomas Harvey, uh, who is the manager of the Global Forest Observations Initiative Office, hosted by Fab South as a secretariat for all GFOI partners, components, and activities. And uh, as we all know, GFOI is one of the geo flagships. And he will uh, give us some of the example activities that are happening under GFY that uh, relate to the biodiversity ecosystems and nature-based solutions. And we will also hear from Alice Hughes, who is a professor and leads the landscape ecology group at the Chinese Academy of Sciences uh, in the Botanical Gardens um, uh, Department of the Chinese Academy of Sciences. Alice has worked ex extensively across the tropics and has held various positions in Thailand, Australia, Costa Rica, and the UK before moving to China. Uh, so without uh, wasting more time, uh, let me invite uh, Tim Christofferson uh, to give us our first presentation of this session. Welcome, Tim. Thank you very much, Anastasia, and uh, hello, colleagues. Nice to be here. And um, I would like to give a brief introduction to the topic, but also to the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. Um, I have provided my slides to um, the Secretariat. I'm not going to go through all of them, but it's for sharing with the participants. So if you don't mind, I'll just um, speak without the slides. And they were just for, for sharing. So first of all, what 
are nature-based solutions. The definition that is the mostly, most widely used is from IUCN. They are actions to protect, sustainably manage, and restore natural or modified ecosystems that address societal challenges effectively and adaptively, simultaneously providing human well-being and biodiversity benefits. So there's a number of key uh, terms in there that are very important, both for, for Earth observations, but also for the objectives, why we employ nature-based solutions and how they should be done. One example that I would like to highlight how this works and what this is, is the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration that was adopted in March 2019. And the UN Decade has the aim to prevent, halt, and reverse the degradation of ecosystems worldwide. FAO and UNEP are asked to lead the UN Decade, and we have by now over 70 different partners, both from the UN system, but also from across NGOs like WWF. <clears throat> uh, we have ICN, we have the World Bank, the World Economic Forum. So there's a broad platform of partners that is driving this UN decade as a 10 year program to ensure we have harnessed the full power of nature for sustainable development. Why is that important? So first of all, the recent findings, both from IPCC, and, but more so from IPES, are that conservation of ecosystems is no longer enough to halt biodiversity loss, but also to ensure we reach the Paris Agreement targets and the Sustainable Development Goals. Because of the high level of ecosystem degradation that we've seen across the globe, we now need to restore at a very large scale ecosystems of different types across the globe. And why we need to do that? To address the interconnected challenges of climate biodiversity, food security, and health. And there are numerous additional benefits for the SDGs from restoration. Since this is an audience focused on Earth observations, a few of the key statistics, of course, of the immense loss of biodiversity and ecosystems and their related ecosystem services. Since 1990, the world has lost 420 million hectares of forests. That's an area the size of India plus Nigeria, more or less. So that just happened in the last 30 years. We're still losing an area of forests about 10 million hectares a year or all the forest area of Germany. And with that loss, um, we get closer to climate change tipping points. We see rapid biodiversity loss, but we also see increasing emergence of zoonotic diseases that some of them have the potential to become pandemics. Oceans and coasts, the picture is similar. 66% of ocean ecosystems are now damaged, degraded or modified. One third of commercial marine fish populations are fished unsustainably. And the list uh, goes on. So the point here is that while in the last 30 years, produced capital has about doubled, the world has lost 40% of its natural capital. So we have to turn that situation around. Uh, the system of environmental and economic accounting was already mentioned and natural capital accounting. So there, is, um, there are several efforts underway to monitor these trends. And one that is new is that the UN Statistics Division now collects information on a broader set of indicators for the well-being of nations, and that includes natural capital. So there's a lot of monitoring needs for that. If we come back to the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration, we have identified three main action pathways for changing this trajectory and coming to that aim of preventing, halting, and reversing the degradation of ecosystems. The first is to build a global movement that is taken off uh, earlier this month under the hashtag Generation Restoration. For restoration, we're building a global digital hub for key projects, resources, knowledge, funders, on restoration. 
we are looking at fiscal policy reform, etc. For all of that uh, movement building has one purpose to build political will for difficult political decisions like subsidy reform. And the third pathway is that we also, of course, need the technical capacity for implementation and also for monitoring. I'd like to mention here that the UN decade has a number of task forces that we operate with. One is on best practices with about 30 organizations and perhaps more important for this group, we have a monitoring task force that is led by FAO, by the Forest Department. And that monitoring task force now has about 270 experts from over 100 organizations. Probably some of you in the audience are part of the monitoring task force of the UN decade. It has a terrestrial and aquatic and a socioeconomic subgroup. In the next few um, months and years, we're launching an action plan in about three months for the UN decade. We're launching our digital hub later this year, and we will ask all countries, all UN member states to submit flagship initiatives for key restoration areas. So these could become flagships for how countries address this challenge of nature-based solutions and using nature-based solutions for achieving the sustainable development goals. More details on that in the presentations that I shared, but for the sake of time, I will stop here and look forward to questions. Thank you, back to you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Tim. Uh, I think uh, what we say is we will have all the presentations first and then towards the end, we will uh, pick, uh, we will uh, do all the questions and answer sessions. Uh, so at this point, uh, we will listen to our next presentation from Amy Ginsberg, uh, where we, we, we are hoping to get some ideas on specific op opportunities uh, for GEO in the area, and she'll be giving us um, uh, some uh, examples from her work at Sunbi. So welcome, Amy. Uh, thank you, everyone, and good morning. I hope my internet connection is going to remain stable. Um, and I'm going to share the screen from my side. Um, so I'm going to speak to potential opportunities for the, the global community related to ecosystem accounting. Um, I'll touch on what ecosystem accounting is, uh, the key layers used and highlight key lessons relevant to the geo community that have emerged from testing the application of ecosystem accounts in three SDG indicators, and then speak to potential opportunities. So ecosystem accounting refers to the measurement of stocks and uh, ecosystem of ecosystem assets and flows on ecosystem services. It's guided by the, the SEER that, that Tim mentioned, um, specifically the ecosystem accounting guidelines, which were adopted in March 2021. And it's inherently spatially based. Um, and as a global framework, Earth observation is an important data input. And this is recognized in one of the GEO initiatives, Earth observation for ecosystem accounting. Um, as a systematic and standardized framework, ecosystem accounts can provide information for national and global indicators, such as the SDGs. But if they're to inform decision and policy making, it's imperative that their results are meaningful in country. And South Africa was one of five countries piloting the development of ecosystem accounts in a project called Natural Capital Accounting and Valuation of Ecosystem Services, which was funded by the EU and implemented globally by UNSD and UNEP. And through this project, we contributed to methods by compiling accounts and testing global indicators, global ecosystem classification typologies, and global platforms. A key finding has been that it is important to always have an interpretation and sense-making step at the national level, and I'll briefly explain or illustrate this. So Earth observation has been useful in supplementing our existing knowledge and earlier non-Earth observation data to improve the key data layers that we use in compiling um, land and terrestrial ecosystem accounts in this case. So here and the, the two foundational la data layers were uh, the national vegetation map, 
which are based on original field survey, earth observation and other data and expert knowledge. And then national land cover map on the left, which is earth observation data interpreted along with filters on known land use. And this interpretation step in both cases is very important for ecologically meaningful use and application of those layers. Um, and both of these were used to compile land and terrestrial ecosystem accounts from 1990 to 2014, which were released last year. And um, we're used to test the application uh, of ecosystem accounts for reporting on three SDG indicators. And that's what I'll focus on. So the first indicator is forest ecosystem extent for the SDG indicator 15.11. And testing this indicator highlighted global versus national definitions and approaches to determining the percentage of land under forest. The broad definitions of forest used by the FAO included wooded, wooded vegetation types with over 10% canopy cover. And the map on the top left is what this looks like. Now this includes timber plantations and stands of invasive alien trees um, in this map, which and both timber plantations and invasive alien trees are a major pressure on ecosystems, biodiversity and water security in South Africa. So including these in the South African context doesn't provide an ecologically meaningful indicator from a biodiversity or a healthy ecosystem perspective. In other words, not tre all trees are equal. Instead, we use the national vegetation map, which includes uh, wooded vegetation as true forest and is indicated in the black in this lower map. And you can see that these are very small areas. Uh, it also includes savanna, which are grassy landscapes with trees and thicket, which are low dense uh, woody vegetation. And the lesson in testing the forest indicator is that it's important to have these ecologically based delineation of ecosystem types, such as the national vegetation map. We see a similar lesson from looking at the extent of water related ecosystem extent for SDG uh, sub indicator under 6.661. So this table compares the results of global versus national data sets. The European Commission's Joint Research Center data set um, at a 30 meter resolution shows that 0.5% of the South African land area is made up of these water-related ecosystems. Um, the Global Lakes and Wetlands database gives us at 1.3%, which is similar, but still 100,000 hectares difference from information coming from the land and terrestrial ecosystem accounts. Um, and all three of these miss small wetlands and underestimate uh, wetland extent. So in highly seasonal and arid zones particularly, it's very important to use more than just earth observation. And this is what um, the South African inventory of inland aquatic ecosystems does. It provides a robust estimate of these ecosystems using a combination of several data sources and on-ground mapping. So this layer helps us to be able to tease apart actual loss of water-related ecosystems as a result of conversion to agriculture or mining, for instance, and what is the result of natural, seasonal, or long-term fluctuations. This is also important when it comes to tracking long-term variation um, for more accurate descriptions of uh, delivery of ecosystem services. We faced another challenge in the last indicator and in using a global approach to determine the proportion of land that is degraded over total land area for SDG indicator 1531. The potential use of normalized vegetation index, NDVI, which is a proxy for net primary productivity, um, and the potential of using this to assess condition was explored. But productivity is not always an improvement as this can signify degradation in the case of bush encroachment in some of our ecosystems and invasive alien plants. So the map on the top right is, in cre is created using trends.earth tool and looking inside the circle um, on the map, it shows a so-called improvement in productivity. But comparing that to the same area in the map below, it's evident that this area is um, actually exhibiting long-term degradation. 
And the lower map uses a different approach, but um, the final result was that NDVI alone cannot provide a suitable measure for, of degradation. It's just too recent, needs detailed analysis and ground truthing. And what this meant was that we weren't able to finalize an ecosystem condition account, but we're still working on doing so. And once developed, it will produce a more reliable indicator of degradation. So the, the summary of findings from this country level comparison um, highlight that the global models and earth observation data are extremely important. But these data models and the indicators relying on them require in-country validation and sometimes interpretation for them to give meaningful results at the country level. And it's through multidisciplinary and this multi-scale collaborative effort over the last couple of years that um, these that was integral for highlighting these and other lessons. So in terms of the potential opportunities for the geo community, we suggest that this is, they are to work with in-country partners who know the ecological context to co-produce products and raise awareness of the importance of the practice of ensuring uh, processes allow time to validate results um, as part of the solution. Uh, we also promote in situ data collection for monitoring as being crucial for validating global models, training models, and can build up to a degree, especially using citizen science. Uh, the opportunity to strengthen data infrastructure and, and human capacity to make sense of, validate, and interpret and use Earth observation data. And with South Africa's newly released national um, natural capital accounting strategy, there are clear opportunities to collaborate with institutions like Statistics South Africa, Sanbi, and other partners. And there's also an opportunity to engage through the natural capital accounting communities of practice that now exist both regionally, the Africa NCA community of practice, and nationally. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alice. A uh, very enlightening presentation, and uh, glad to see that there are really very good opportunities uh, that can be tackled by uh, the geo community. Uh, next, uh, we are going to hear from Alice Huge, a tropical botanical garden, uh, Chinese Academy of Sciences. And uh, she's going to give us a presentation uh, titled Marking a Path to Eco Civilization. Welcome, Alice. Thank you, and thank you all. So, I'm here on behalf of APBON, which is the Asia Pacific Biodiversity Observation Network and is part of the GeoBON initiative. And today I'm going to be talking about an intersection of both a little bit of my own work and some of the work of the APBON um, group and just why the Asia Pacific region is such an important region and why we really need to appreciate the nexus between human needs and biodiversity if we're going to have effective conservation across this region. So first of all, all of you will be familiar with the global planetary boundary concept. The fact that the way we've modified the earth means that, especially for biodiversity, we are way beyond the bounds of what we should be. But in order to do successful conservation, we need to work within the bounds of reality. And that means acknowledging our impact on the planet. And often when we talk about quite why we're losing global biodiversity, people always say, well, there's too many people. We just have too many people on the planet. And whilst we do indeed have a very large human population and there's been exponential growth in recent years, Future projections show that outside the African continent, we're unlikely to see similar increases into the future. However, what we often seem to forget is that global diets have often changed and our individual per capita footprints have transformed over the last few decades. The amount of meat, fat and sugar consumption have increased exponentially. And these footprints should not be forgotten because it means that every individual is having a much larger impact. And unless we appreciate this and our human needs in future conservation plans, we're simply not going to achieve the changes that we need in order to maintain global biodiversity. And wherever you look on the planet, we see the same thing. Countries like China, where I'm sitting now, have seen literally over 100% increase in the consumption of protein, fat, and sugar. And these products are responsible for a much larger footprint. Furthermore, we've seen a particular increase in the growth of certain crops, 
We've seen a loss of diversity of various types of crop plant, many of which will have been domesticated for thousands of years, like native rice species, and therefore can actually maintain high diversity. And if you go to Southeast Asia and you survey an old growth rice paddies, you'll actually find quite high diversity. And when those have been intensified, we lose species that depend on them. And if we look at what these trends look like, we can see that the greatest increases are actually in some of the oil crops. And many of these, particularly soybean and palm oil, are disproportionately grown in the tropics and often at the expense of native ecosystems. These kinds of graph underscore why we cannot do conservation work in the absence of integrating into it human needs and the fact that we need integrated solutions that enable sustainable development, maintaining biodiversity, whilst also meeting the needs of people, especially in regions like Southeast Asia. And if we look at palm oil for a moment, we can see that most of you will already have accidentally at least consumed palm oil today. It's become something that's ubiquitous in our daily diets, from our toothpaste, our shampoo, to our food. And yet almost all of that is coming from just two countries. And two decades ago, the areas where it is being grown now would have been forest. So we need to think about our own individual footprints and the uh, implications for regions like the Southeast Asian region. Now, AP1 focuses on the Asia Pacific region. And what many of you may be unaware of is as well as having more than half the world's population, actually considerably more than that, it's also a hotspot of global threat across different taxa. So the map that you can see now is a map of threatened mammal species. And you can see Southeast Asia is really coming out there as being a hotspot of threatened mammal species. It also has destruction of other ecosystems. So for example, it has some of the highest rates of mining on Earth. And this is particularly important when we consider that ecosystems like karst ecosystems, which make up about 20% of Southeast Asia and often will have unique species with a single karst harboring up to 12 species found nowhere else on the planet but that one hill. And yet these karst systems have a loss of about 5.7% of area every single year, meaning we're losing species that have not been scientifically described. We also have more than half the world's dams, and the image you see here is actually a modified human footprint index, something that I personally am working on now, that shows just how impacted Southeast Asia is. This also underscores the point that when we talk about global priorities for conservation, we cannot just focus on pristine areas. Unfortunately, in areas like Southeast Asia, because it has a high human population, but also a very long historic um, history of having human habitation, almost all of this area will have seen at least some modification. And that means we need to work out how to maintain biodiversity in the face of human needs and not try to view pristine areas, wildernesses versus areas that are actually often highly biodiverse but also being utilized by various species and are essential to conserve if we're going to maintain species in areas like this. We also have some of the world's highest deforestation rates. So the map you see now shows fragment size of all of the forests in mainland Southeast Asia. Unfortunately, countries like Cambodia have seen almost half their forest loss in about 20 to 30 years. So the rates of deforestation are much higher than most people outside this region will realize. And again, highlights the need to set meaningful targets that acknowledge human needs while ensuring we maintain key areas for biodiversity. And yet this area has some of the most diverse regions of the planet. It has uh, the most fresh, uh, diverse freshwater ecosystems on the planet with more than 1,200 migratory freshwater fish in the Mekong region alone. And yet the planned dams in this region may cause a loss of migratory fish biomass of up to 80%. Of course, given that they make up to about 80% of protein for um, over 60 million people in this region, this has knock-on effects for society and economy. And we cannot look at these different things in isolation. Understanding these threats are key to mitigating them. But at the same time, to develop sustainably, we need to find 
um, mechanisms that both preserve human needs, have economic returns and maintain biodiversity. And this will necessarily include things like uh, supply chain tracking to ensure that we have deforestation free supply chains. Otherwise, we will continue to see increased loss of ecosystems across this region. Within the AP Bond chapter, we try to move between these two worlds of the academic sphere where we monitor ecosystems using experts, including scientists, as well as people from NGOs and rangers across the region, and translate this to enable evidence-based policy. Furthermore, we have a long-term monitoring network across this region to try to understand how some of the ecosystems in this area change over time and we can better understand the impacts of things like climate change into the future. We know that Southeast Asia faces major threats and the first um, step to try to mitigate these is having high quality data to develop sensible baselines and help guide targets into the future. In order to do this, we aggregate data from multiple systems, including multiple different types of data to try and understand where species are and how they respond to different forms of environmental change. We combine this with long-term monitoring, and this is particularly from the ELTA network, which is very active within this region, so that we can develop sensible uh, ecological metrics across different uh, temporal and spatial indices. We also try to collate better data from across this region to provide the data needed for management, as well as meaningful indicators into the future. However, this is challenging on its own, but it's only the first step. From this, we try to develop meaningful targets that integrate into them both the best of biodiversity data, including critiquing all forms of existing data, as well as gaining more data from monitoring different sites across this region, but also integrating this into policy and practice. For example, within China, we have something called ecological civilization. A major tool behind eco-civilization is something called ecological red lines, which can also be known as land zoning. Basically, it classifies areas into three predominant types of area, those for biodiversity, shared lands, and those for humans. And within each, there is a specific suite of different um, management strategies to maintain diversity. In order to identify these areas, we try to use the best science-based tools to aggregate the data in order to develop these indicators and maintain both ecosystem service provision and biodiversity into the future. Furthermore, we try to integrate into them different metrics of ecosystem function and service provision. So as we move into the future, we can maintain both biodiversity, but also the crucial services provided by it and of course, nature-based solutions to climate change. This is also important in the light of perverse incentives, which, also, um, which frequently prioritize green over biodiversity, meaning that native ecosystems can still be replaced by monocultures under the guise of climate-friendly uh, development. It is key to actually integrate and synergize different priorities, including those identified by different UN conventions if we are going to maintain biodiversity into the future. And something we do within the APBON group is try to integrate these different types of data, but also to discuss it in different venues so that it's available to policymakers as well as academics and managers across this region. Furthermore, by working with protected areas across the uh, region, we can ensure that our metrics are meaningful across scales and can translate into policy and practice. So this is part of our strategy. Again, all of these slides are available to anyone, so you can read this later. And this is actually from a publication that the APBON group recently put out. Successful conservation also needs to acknowledge the nexus between human needs and sustainable ecosystem governance. This also includes One Health approaches. And some of my work in particular recently has been looking at how um, our management of ecosystems impacts on things like bat immune systems and spillover risks, because unless we actually factor One Health approaches into the future, we will see future pandemics. Making sure we maintain healthy uh, ecosystems with healthy species and reduce stress and pressure on native ecosystems is going to be critical to preventing future spillover events. 
And we try to collate and integrate these very different types of data to help guide us into a safer and more biosecure future. So with that, I'd like to thank you all and I'm happy to join the panel session shortly. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Alice. Um, next, uh, we'll listen to a presentation by Tom Harvey, uh, who is the manager at the GFOI, which is one of the GEO flagships. And uh, his uh, presentation is titled The National Systems for Improving Forest Information and Reporting uh, for Multiple Purposes. Welcome, Tom. Lovely. Thank you, uh, Anastasia, and thank you to the GEO Secretariat for putting on a, another fantastic um, GEO symposium and also to the, the presenters before me who, who have done a very nice job presenting some very interesting facts and some very um, some very good food for thought. You have uh, left some very big shoes for me to fill. I hope I can round out the session uh, in, in, in a manner that it deserves. So as Anastasia said, uh, my name is Tom Harvey and I'm the manager of the GFOI office, um, which is based out of FAO, but functions as an independent secretariat for all GFOI, um, part, or all GFOI partners and activities. Next slide, please, Rick. Um, so you've probably all heard me before talk about GFOI, um, I, but I just wanted to repeat it again, because I think um, what we have seen already from the other presenters is some really interesting, I guess, technical approaches and some really useful statistics and examples of um, how some of these other ecosystems can be monitored. But, I wanted to give a quick presentation of perhaps how a, um, a geo flagship or the geo architecture can perhaps be used as a forum to help address um, some of these challenges going forward. So I wanted to just present here a little bit of a, con a little bit of the context of what GFY is, um, and then I'll go through to how I think some of the lessons that we've learned to date um, can perhaps serve us going forward as we look to potentially expand into some of these new monitoring areas in the geo work program. So very quickly, um, GFY is in its, in its rawest form, a voluntary partnership for coordinating support to tropical countries on forest monitoring and associated greenhouse gas emissions. Um, we're a voluntary partnership. We are flexible. We are um, like to think we include all of the major players who are providing support to tropical uh, countries on forest monitoring. Um, and we like to be, I guess, uh, responsive to, to emerging needs. So. Sitting, I guess, outside of the more formal arrangements of the UNFCCC or some of the World Bank trust funds and everything that we work with, we are a practically minded solutions uh, based uh, voluntary partnership that um, is able to mobilize the resources of our community to help address um, tropical forest monitoring needs. Uh, next slide, Pedro. So as I said at the top, um, GFY was founded under GEO in 2011, and we continue to serve as a GEO flagship for forest, something we are very proud of. Um, we currently have lead partners from Australia, the Committee on Earth Observations, uh, the Committee on Earth Observation Satellites, the European Space Agency, FAO, Norway, UK, USA, and the World Bank, who broadly represent the major development partners who are providing assistance to tropical countries on forest monitoring. And we have many other contributing partners, including UNFCCC Secretariat, the IPCC's Technical Support Unit, universities, uh, technical, um, technical and policy experts. And we are, of course, open to new partners. Next slide, please, Rick. So I guess in the context of the topic of this session, I wanted to um, maybe take a step back a little bit um, and talk about um, perhaps the, the perspective of, of countries, the perspective of the decision makers who manage um, some of these, uh, the, who manage this national capital, who, who manage these ecosystems and how we can go about, I guess, solving the issue of getting information into their hands to empower them to make logical decisions. Um, I don't mean to undermine the enormously impressive and the enormous breadth and depth of technical work uh, that goes into uh, monitoring the earth uh, and as it changes over time. But in my opinion, many of the technical challenges that they, they have not been solved, we will continue to improve our technical capability as time goes by. But technically we understand how to monitor the earth's surface and ecosystems and be it forest, be it agriculture, be it what have you, and as they change over time. In my experience, the challenge is how do we get that information into operational ongoing systems in countries that are trusted by those making decisions over um, 
the future of these ecosystems that we are talking about. A lot of the countries that we go into as GFY partners, um, sometimes we will go to one ministry um, and there's one team working on monitoring for reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation or REDD+. Plus. There might be another working on national greenhouse gas inventories. There might be another working on monitoring for sustainable development goals. There might be another working on the forest resources assessment for uh, FAO. There might be another doing agriculture and maybe another doing wetlands and another doing mangroves. And this, I guess, is, um, you know, this evolves from there being so many different reporting forums and so many different um, information needs uh, in these countries. So what we are trying to do through GFOI is encourage the establishment of a centralised national forest monitoring system, which can be used to conduct, I guess, consistent and credible reporting that can be used for multiple different needs or multiple different information needs or, or reporting forums. So the concept of a national forest monitoring system was born out of Red Plus and the need to conduct reporting to the UNFCCC or to um, for performance-based payments from some of the various funds are out there, but their intentions are much broader. They're intended to be a centralised natural system, a centralised sovereign national system, which can be used for generating reliable forest resource information, for informing national policy development, planning, um, and other other national priorities. So, what I want to highlight is that we shouldn't, as we think about these other fields, be um, I guess wanting to reinvent the wheel. And I know throwing out that catchphrase is something you probably hear in a lot of these conferences, we don't want to reinvent the wheel. But I think it's really quite important in this context, because as I said, an enormous amount of work has gone into solving um, or into setting up systems and architectures, building institutional capacity, building um, the uh, interaction with decision makers to get them to trust data and to trust information that comes out of these systems. We don't then want to go in and, and I guess start from the ground up when all we are doing is, I guess, with Earth's observations, we are monitoring units of land and how they change over time. And if that unit of land is a forest, or if that unit of land is a patch of agriculture, or if it's a mangrove or a wetland or, or some sea grasses, it doesn't really matter. As long as we have the ancillary data to inform what the land, what, what the piece of land was before and what it was after it changed, we can put all that through the same architecture, the same institutional processes, the same technical systems to help us monitor change through time using, using a consistent centralised national architecture. I realise what I'm saying is perhaps uh, you know, a little bit dreamy in an ideal world, but it is what we should be aiming for. Because fundamentally, when you have countries reporting for multiple different purposes, they're all ultimately estimates. And when all those estimates are ultimately different and there's no way of tracing them back to a central core data set or a central core system, they're all in theory inconsistent and not in agreement and can technically be proven to be wrong. So what I'm saying is there is a very, very important role here of looking at what is the what are the systems, architecture, institutional arrangements that we can build upon that is already in place and that we have been investing in for the past years to, to decades and how can we add into that um, some of these other uh, ecosystem services that we're talking about. Uh, next slide, please, Rick. So um, I've made your life very difficult for you here, Rick. Sorry, this is one that requires a few clicks. So if I can ask you to click about 10 times now, um, that would be great. So this is an example of the GFY community. So GFY is the product of the collaborative actions of our partners. Um, yeah, that's enough for now, thanks, Rick. All of whom have um, large programs of support that they are delivering unilaterally to um, tropical forested countries, but all of whom realise that the demand for support from tropical forest, forested countries is far more than any one entity could provide alone. But of course, they still have their own reasons to deliver this support, be it existing bilateral relations with countries, existing technical um, preferences or existing capabilities that they're able to provide. But they recognise the value of, of coming together and seeking to provide a smaller part, uh, one small part to a much larger package of support than any one partner could provide alone. So here you can see all of our partners who come together seek to unite behind identifying the common set of country needs for international support, and then who is best placed, who has a comparative advantage, who has existing relationships, who has the available resources to go into the country and provide that specific support. Next, next click, please, Rick. 
And then, as I said earlier, trying to develop these centralised national forest monitoring systems um, that produce uh, information on forest change and resultant greenhouse gas emissions and removals in, in our case, um, that can, uh, can of course be built upon to produce um, answers for multiple different reporting forums. Next click, please, Rick. Be that, uh, and, and just keep going now, I think about six times or five times, be it for the UNFCCC, be it for the SDGs, the World Bank um, Carbon Fund, the Green Climate Fund, the, the FRA, or national policy and decision-making. So what we're trying to do is provide, I guess, a, an organisational framework for how we can come together and not confuse countries with multiple different partners going in um, to, I guess, provide assistance to conduct reporting for various different um, forums or information needs. Next slide, please, Rick. And so this is um, a new concept that we have come up with. This is essentially the GFY framework for how you take countries through from the early stages of designing a monitoring system um, that suits their needs um, through to the very implementation of that monitoring system. So this is in the context of, of MRV for Red Plus, but the same principles can be applied for monitoring for any ecosystem. So at the left here, you'll see our foundation document, the methods and guidance documentation, which sets out, I guess, um, the, uh, the sort of base level requirements that a country needs to consider in how they would develop their national forest monitoring system. The next step there is Red Compass, which includes a set of specific actions that they would need to undertake to implement this system. The next is a registry of tools, which provides specific tools linked to those actions that they need to undertake to conduct that monitoring. And then the final one, OpenMRV, which is a new platform we'll be launching this afternoon, provides detailed instructional materials and training resources for how you implement those tools and fundamentally your MRV system. So this is a framework that GFY is providing, not only to, I guess, uh, streamline the support that countries receive, but to also, I guess, provide an avenue for how international partners can feed their technical solution, their methodology, their guidance into a pathway that can be taken up by countries. So there is an enormous amount of work that is happening in our community by individuals. GFY is not seeking to um, contribute to this it itself in terms of direct technical assistance. Instead, our job is to organise this into a logical package of support that can help um, countries to actually conduct this monitoring to support their own unique national needs. And I think that um, as we look to potentially add new ecosystems or new um, monitoring purposes into the geo work program, we should maybe look at some of these existing frameworks and existing architectures, things that we've built in the past that we can add upon. Um, uh, as I said earlier, and I, I do think the geo framework and the geo work program is very well placed um, to support some of this work. Next slide, please, Rick. And this is just a quick invite. If you are interested to come along to the Open MRV platform this afternoon, you'll see a little bit of GFY's work in action. This is how we're um, providing detailed instructional materials to support the implementation of uh, forest monitoring systems uh, for tropical countries. And I think, next slide please, Rick. I think that is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tom, and uh, for that good presentation. Uh, glad to hear so much about uh, GFY. Uh, now at this point, uh, uh, I want to invite all the panelists. I know we are we we are we don't have a lot of time, but we want to answer a few questions that have uh, some of them from the audience. I'll start with those that are coming from the audience, and uh, um, I think if you also find um, uh, the attend uh, the participants kindly, there's a question and answer. Uh, box, you can put your questions there to the panelists. Uh, so we do have a question there. What do you see as the key areas of natural capital accounting that EO can improve in the near term? And uh, I think this would go to Amy who talked about the work they're doing at Sanbi. So welcome Amy and uh, attendees kindly uh, put your questions in the QA session. Thank you. Um, thanks. I'm going to try and keep my video on and see if my connection holds. Um, so I think that the, the key areas that Earth Observation can improve on in the near future um, 
it's you know so they there are great tools and models and data available and um we've been working closely with various teams to to test and validate them and that is really the you know the sort of the key area of working together i think um so it's uh certainly when those when earth observation is supporting us in um in seeing how ecosystems are changing and understanding uh ecosystem services um that's that in-country validation for for making those those tools and products really useful for us is is the is a main focus area and then i think also working uh with uh, it's got a similar sort of theme but working with the national statistical offices too in preparing for this presentation i was chatting with one of the gis people in our statistics south africa and and he just highlighted you know what are still remain the challenges in integrating um environmental social and economic data um in a spatially explicit manner um and and that 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 requires you know, collaborative efforts um, and using the great technology and information that we have available, but actually working together to figure out how we can make these more useful to really understand um, the, the 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 contribution that that biodiversity and ecosystem makes to uh, ecosystems make to our economy, and the dependencies and linkages there, so that we can take that both into country decision making and into um, you know sort of private sector tools as well. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you for your answer. I, and I think in um in a related um question, I would want maybe we go through the the other panelists and maybe they also tell us uh, uh what role they would want uh, each one of them uh in, within the activities that they have shared with us. Uh, what role would you want to see uh geo or the regional geo? Uh, we have like the Afri geo, Ameri geo, the uh, Oceania, and uh, what role do you want them to play towards enabling design, planning, and implementation of activities within the biodiversity ecosystem and uh, nature-based solutions? Next. So if you can look at broadly at the regional geo within your region uh, would play to help you or to improve. Uh, with the design planning and implementation of activities uh, in the nexus so we start with alice then we'll go to tim and then to tom thank you thank you so amy brought up some really good points about data integration i also think more broadly there's a real issue with scientific literacy even among scientists on how we actually understand gis and remotely sensed data for example we just put out a couple of papers, one using the IUCN data, which is some of the most commonly used data on mapping species distributions. We put out another paper on understanding patterns of spatial bias on point-based data. Now, one issue and one real bottleneck into developing good targets for biodiversity is often when people utilize biodiversity data, they don't take time to understand the limitations of that data. And those limitations can be fundamentally important as to actually having appropriate use because you then pair them with other forms of data. And every type of data has different types of bias. If you're using land use data, if you don't take the time to test it, then actually that patch of forest could be a monoculture. So I think a role that GEO could play is not only helping make sure that the data is ecologically meaningful, but also conveying what the limits of sensible use are, because otherwise many people will be purporting some solution or target to biodiversity, which is actually fundamentally wrong because they haven't taken the time to understand what the limits of the data they're using are. And in many cases, those are going to completely alter what the outputs are. So I think developing strong collaborations between different types of scientists so that data is used sensibly and within its limits is going to be critical to developing sensible targets to enable meaningful monitoring, as well as making sure that we do maintain diversity into the future. Thank you, Alice. Uh, Tim, do you have any ideas or uh, opinion on what uh, Geo could do? Yeah, there are two aspects. One was um, already mentioned by Amy and others about natural capital accounting. It's essential that governments, as they now start to measure 
natural capital into inclusive national wealth have a good understanding um, what their natural capital is. And there have been some advances in that in that field recently, but there's still a lot left to do. I would also encourage the GEO members to, um, if there's specific interest in ecosystem restoration, to reach out to the FAO-led monitoring task force for the UN decade on ecosystem restoration. And last but not least, I would hope that we could also use use um, Earth observations for a purpose that is maybe not so often on the front line of your thinking or planning, and which is inspiration. <clears throat> you know that Google put out these timelines of the, the degrading planet and how we've changed Earth in the past uh, 30 years. But there are also some encouraging examples of restoration and how nature can bounce back in given the right conditions. So some of that, um, some of those video sequences, we also have to make available to people out there to show that there is actually hope because there's, there's a growing sense of climate anxiety. There's, um, and, and that leads to apathy. We have to inspire people also with success stories and things that can work well. So I would like to ask all the as observation enthusiasts uh, out there to keep a lookout for those examples that could be shown with remote sensing timelines where nature has recovered over the past decades and make some of those available. Thank you, thank you. And um, they, Tom, I think uh, maybe this might sound a bit uh, awkward being that you're working at GFOI, which is already a geo flagship, but I believe maybe there are areas or gaps or challenges that you may be experiencing with the use of uh, EO data. And uh, maybe you can also uh, give us, uh, maybe uh, tell us what you think maybe geo could do to help uh, maybe towards addressing those issues. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, thanks Anastasia, and thanks to the, the presenters before me. I think they've provided some really useful examples. Um, I realise I harp, I probably harped on this a, a, a bit in my presentation already, but I'm going to go back to it now. Is I don't see the technical limitations as being the challenges. I, I see the real challenges as being getting the data into the hands of the decision makers and getting uh, reliable and consistently produced data into the decision making process and again of course that is something that everybody says we're not just monitoring because we like it we have to monitor to actually affect the change i think that is something that's easy to say um, but it is still very difficult to follow through on that partially because there are so many elements that are sort of outside of our sphere of influence so there are so many things that affect whether or not a forestry minister is going to you know, read a monitoring report to work out how much his forest is changing and what's projected to change over time and then if he's going to actually act on that information. But I think there is a lot of effort, that there is a lot more we can do to focus on, on really empowering decision makers with information and, and keeping them accountable with information as well. And one thing that we have been doing at GFY is really trying to set up that, um, I guess, framework that allows countries to design their own monitoring systems right through from the very conceptual stage as to why do you want to do this? What information do you need to get? What are your reporting forums? And then through looking at what the requirements are for that reporting forum, through to selecting specific tools and then providing guidance on how to implement those and actually really building that capability internal to decision-making entities or management entities um, from the ground up still not perfect there are still um you know lots of opportunities for improvement but I, I honestly think that the the challenge is is how do we shift from here's another technical solution here's a better way to improve the accuracy of how we're monitoring land cover by whatever percent to how do we genuinely get this used to inform decision making and how do we genuinely get this used to keep decision makers accountable over time i don't have all the solutions but i do know that working hand in hand with um with national governments and of course, jurisdictional level governments, subnational governments from the ground up to encourage, the, to give them a framework and some guidance to work within, but still able to make their own decisions on the design of their monitoring systems. Um, and to do that over time, this isn't gonna happen in six to 12 months. Uh, in, in the forest monitoring world, it's taken 10 years before we're getting towards um, having operational systems. So I think we need to be really um, quite cognizant of that. 
and slowly allowing them to trust information, to trust data um, and to continue to use it consistently. Sorry, Anastasia, go on. Sorry, Anastasia, did you have another? Thank you, thank you, thank you for your uh, very... Uh... Yeah, well, uh, unfortunately, I cannot ask another question because uh, we we've, we are running out of time. And uh, I really want to thank you all for your insightful presentations. I think we have learned a lot uh, about uh, what is happening in the field of biodiversity ecosystems and nature-based solutions, all the way from the, uh, the UN's initiative on the decade of uh, uh, ecosystems restoration, the natural capital accounting, GFOI, and uh, what the Asia Pacific Bond is doing in terms of conserving biodiversity. And I think we have heard a lot about the data that's being used. These are uh, extensive use of EU data. We could do better in terms of quality sharing and maybe ensuring that uh, whatever data is there is reliable and it's usable by the decision makers. And perhaps as we wind up, I would want maybe to also challenge uh, each one of you and everyone else who is attending. Uh, to, I would have wanted maybe to post this as a question in terms of the fact that we look at decision makers, but maybe we don't get down to find out whether those decisions actually trickle down uh, to the communities who are maybe the, you know, the people who actually do the conservation efforts on the ground. Maybe they plant the trees, they're the ones who maybe even cut the trees, do they get uh those the information that they need so that they can live um in harmony with nature as they conserve it and understand what benefits are there uh, well maybe that's something for another day so thank you very much uh for all your presentations for your time thanks to the participants for uh listening and uh if you have more questions i believe uh, uh the geo secretariat uh, uh has channels to post a further uh, questions, and I believe the panelists should be able to get back. Thank you very much. Have a good day.